So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation to talk a little bit. I am trying to figure out ways that I can actually introduce my talk, and I'm not sure I can do that. Uh, it's probably a series of ramblings, hopefully some not so independent thoughts, definitely some celebration, but maybe what I hope to do is bring everyone together to think about uh, how we should move forward uh, when we talk about treating rare and ultra-rare cancer. So thank you very much for having me here, and hopefully afterwards maybe we can have more of a discussion than potentially questions. So I, I wanted to start with history, and I think the history of the modern era in sarcoma dates back to 2014 when we had this publication, which we all know about. This was the EORTC frontline data of doxorubicin versus doxorubicin and ifosfamide. Not so much to talk about the outcomes, but I think it set the standards of how our patients do in the frontline setting with doxorubicin, and we had median progression-free survivals of about 4.6 months and median overall survivals of about 13 months. I do want to point out this was published in 2014, but it was an older data set. It was actually the trial started in 2003 and took maybe about 10 years to accrue. Why is this important? because right off the heels of that, we had really interesting data with evophosphamide, a bromoifosforamide mustard, a hypoxia-activated drug that came out. This was a, a single-arm phase two study, again in the frontline setting, but we see median progression-free survival of about 6.5 months, reasonable, but median overall survival of about 21.5 months. So, you know, potential improvement over the URTC data set. Right off of the heels of this was the randomized study of doxorubicin and alaritumab versus doxorubicin alone. And the control arm of doxorubicin, interestingly, did what we saw in the EORTC data set, about 14 months overall survival, but the combination, 26 months overall survival, right? So again, potential signs of tremendous efficacy. Well, we then had our pivotal efforts. The first one was the evophosphamide study, again in the frontline setting with doxorubicin versus doxorubicin, run by SARC, SARC 21. Um, this was not a blinded study. This was mandated to have overall survival as a primary endpoint, and again in the first line setting. And we know it was a completely negative study, right? What was interesting here is setting the modern data set for how patients do in the frontline setting with doxorubicin. Again, median progression-free survival of six months, but overall survival is about 20 months. So did we just over-interpret a single-arm phase once two study, right? Or are we actually missing efficacy signals? And we also know that the follow-up to the Alaritumab study, the announced study, was also a negative study. This was an interesting study in that it was blinded, randomized, placebo control, overall survival, again, mandated as the primary endpoint, but we had dual primary endpoints, not only in soft tissue sarcoma, but also in leiomyosarcoma, single histological subtype, but we hear about the tremendous intra-subtype variability of this disease. Um, we did really well. We rapidly accrued 620 patients in 10 months. You know, maybe that's also a problem with how we do studies if we're rapidly accruing, which we can talk about. But totally negative study, again, setting the standards of how our patients do in the frontline setting. So why do I think this is an important error in sarcoma? Because at this time, we had about five or six large randomized studies, something our community has never done. So we need to congratulate ourselves. Over 2,000 participants, but all studies were negative, right? So why? I actually think SARC should get together and have seminars as to why all of these studies were negative so we can learn and move forward about this. But when I think about it, it's the variability. Right? And so how many variables can confound a clinical trial? When we think about these studies that we do often in 99 sites worldwide to accrue them, we have tremendous variability. Sometimes we have studies that look at 40 to 60 different diseases on one study, different clinical presentations. Um, I also think we have tremendous variations in practice. And when we think about overall survival studies, in a specific sarcoma subtype, what I have available in a subsequent line of therapy may be totally different than what some European countries have, right? So all of that is going to affect a composite endpoint like overall survival. I also think we don't necessarily design our studies correctly, right? So how can we really learn about that? But, but putting a lot of thought into this, in which I have, I really think one of our biggest problems is that we don't always study the same populations 
throughout the course of clinical trial design. So we see signals in very small signal finding studies that we're really excited about. And then when we go into these large phase three studies, we're not studying the same patient populations, either from the variables that I mentioned before, how we accrue patients, the variabilities in clinical practice, the types of patients that we put on studies, but how can we expect to see the same signals? So how can we actually start to study the same patients consistently throughout clinical trial development? So can we do that and have we do that? And I think the answer is yes and why. I think why is because we're learning more and more about the diseases we treat. And this is because of really amazing individual efforts like we heard before, but also these large scale genomic efforts and a lot of work from our pathologists. I just picked one of the studies of about 2,500 patients that give us insight into the genomic variations of these diseases, right? So we're beginning to understand the diseases better. And I think this has created a tremendous opportunity for us. Why? Because this genetic diversity that we see in the diseases we treat is actually very attractive for drug development. And we all know that many of the diseases we treat is an open field for the application of technology and the scientific advancement. So we're seeing an influx of new agents and trials. Most of them are subtype and disease specific. And many of them are coming into early potential registrational tracks, right? This is a wonderful opportunity for us, but it also creates an opportunity where we need to grow and learn. Well, how have we done? Well, amazingly well, and this is where we congratulate ourselves, because 10 years ago I could never have a slide like this, but I tried to put together just thinking off the top of my head of agents that were FDA approved or NCCN compendium listed in our disease within the last, what, five, six years, and there's over 20 agents here. So this is remarkable, and this is where we need to congratulate our community. We have to think about this a little bit more specifically, right? And I think this is one of the cruxes of the talk. Let's talk about the diseases that we're trying to treat. We're treating ultra-rare cancers. And I want to say that many of these diseases are often new disease entities that have been recently genetically defined. So as experts, we're expected to treat them, but we also often don't understand the natural history of the disease, the clinical variations, the genetic variations of the disease. It's just not well described, but yet we're asked to treat it and study drugs in it. Very importantly, we often don't understand the clinical needs of the patients that we're trying to treat. And so if we're designing clinical trials, the outcomes should be there to improve what the patients need. So we have to have a better understanding of what the patients need. And with that, if we can bring those together, the understanding of these rare diseases, the clinical subtypes, the genomic subtypes, right, then we can think about how to design studies that are right for the biology of the disease, the patient needs, and the mechanism of action of the drug. And this is the critical context of the talk. In our community, how do we do this, right? How do we bring it together so we can influence how things are done? We can influence regulatory bodies to say this is how we should do it, and you need to listen to us, and we can also influence our pharmaceutical and biotech colleagues to say this is the right way to do it, right? Variable for each disease, but we also talk about this, but we don't also have the effect that we need to have because when we go to regulatory bodies, we still have to look for assist response rates. We still have to look for overall survival endpoints and do they make sense? So how can we gather these data so that we can influence? But I want to put this slide up here for a second and congratulate our community because this is where we're shifting. It's taking time. It's coming from a lot of different directions, but it's happening and it is exciting. How do we do this? I really think we have to focus on four areas, scientific discovery like we talked about before. We need to be better at defining the natural histories of rare cancers, and again, I'll focus on this with the clinical and genetic variations of the disease. We need early signal finding studies, but then we need to develop appropriate larger scale studies that are mirroring the signals that we're seeing in those early phase studies, and I'll add this component that these studies inform appropriate clinical usage of the drugs that are becoming approved, right? Very important how we can develop these paradigms from early based on science all throughout the life cycle of drug development. And, and have we done this and can we do this? Yes. This is an example of pexidartinib. We know about it. The community started working with the drug way back in 2010. It was one of the first basket studies, although we don't get credit for it. 
right? So this is the expansion cohort and diseases that made sense based on their biology and the mechanisms of action of the drug. And we saw some nice signals, but what we really saw were dramatic responses in waterfall plots that we dream of in rare malignancies and that these were sustained, right? So this was a phase one study, expansion cohort. We had about 30 to 40 patients, and the decision was made, let's go to a pivotal study, randomized phase three. Well, that's interesting, but it put a lot of fear in us because this was a disease that we didn't understand. So how are we gonna develop a drug for it, right? So this audience knows of tenosynovial giant cell tumor. I won't go into that. I'm just gonna highlight a few points. One is that it is highly dependent on CSF signaling, and it is not a malignancy. It's a neoplastic process. The majority of the tumor cells are inflammatory cells. They're not the neoplastic clone. But it's also a disease that can affect any joint of the body with really differential penetrance. So it's a hard disease to study and to qualify, right? Most importantly is we didn't understand what patients go through and we didn't understand the needs of our patient. These were patients that were mostly treated by our orthopedic oncologist colleagues. So we had to spend a lot of time with them. And when I say we, I mean our collective community to understand what were the patient's needs. And we had to spend a lot of time talking to patients because the path for each patient is totally different. So we have a neoplastic process, a drug that may shrink a disease, but is that shrinkage important for the patient, right? That's what we needed to show. So the community got together with pharmaceutical companies and came up with novel TGC-specific PROs based on the promise. This is now in the label of the drug, right? But it was a really nice way to understand what patients go through, really nice way to understand if we're helping them, and it was important because it was a really nice way to design a phase three clinical trial. I must say it was really difficult to design the clinical trial because we needed a randomization. Randomization, I think, was important. Placebo was important because it helped define the natural history of the disease. It's, it's an inflammatory condition, so we could have seen spontaneous regressions. But because it was a placebo, there was a hard endpoint of 24 weeks, FDA-mandated resist responses, which we know are horrible in this disease. So there was a lot of worry of how do you pick your alphas and betas off of a small data set from a phase one study and make that your primary endpoint at a, at a hard date in time. So because of that, there was a lot of subjective and objective measures of response that were included into the study. It was a really complicated study for patients. They had a lot of homework. Fortunately, again, highly dependent on CSF signaling, so we saw these waterfall plots that we dream of. Patients had dramatic responses. Responses were meaningful, but there was a lot of missing data. We had to reorder the endpoints before the primary endpoint came out. There was a rare cholestatic hepatotoxicity that affects how we use the drug, an ODAX, and we now have a REMS program. It's approved in the United States, but not in Europe. But importantly, it set the natural history of the disease, and it also set the standards for clinical trial development, and now there are several ongoing phase three studies in this rare disease that are mimicking this design. Another neoplastic process was being evaluated at the same time, desmoid type fibromatosis. Again, very similar study designs, randomization against a placebo, very important here because we knew that these are diseases that can have spontaneous responses and regressions. And you see that in the placebo arm, about a 20 to 30 percent response rate by resist. So if you didn't know that, you would have overinterpreted the mechanisms of action of drug. Novel imaging mechanisms were developed to look at the cellularity of the disease in a novel PRO, right? So a really beautiful study and just mirrored again from our community. So this is where we need to congratulate ourselves because we can do this. But these were neoplastic processes. What do we do when we bring in the complexity of sarcomas, right? Have we been successful? Yes, but the success has been different and we need to discuss this. Phase metastat, epithelioid sarcoma. Epithelioid sarcoma is a very variable disease, proximal, distal, how it presents in patients, how it behaves, how it responds to therapy. But perceived as nothing out there, we had a drug that had activity, right? And so we saw median progression-free survival about 5.5 months, median overall survival of 19 months, and this actually led to FDA approval of the drug. But I'll ask this audience, do we know how to use Taze Metastat? It's first line, is it second line? Is it in combination with chemotherapy? Is it in combination with immunotherapy? We have no idea how to use this drug, right? And again, it's based on a small data set. What would happen if we ran a large randomized clinical trial? History says 
that we may not be able to duplicate this, right? Do we truly understand these patients that were put on this? There is a confirmatory study, but it's again up front with doxorubicin versus doxorubicin. I'm not sure that'll inform usage or be confirmatory of single arm data. So as a community, it's great that we get these drugs approved because our patients need them, but what's the next step? So just some examples. This is uh, IDH1 inhibitor Ivocidinib, an IDH1 mutated chondrosarcoma, NCCN guideline listed, right? We need drugs for this disease so we can celebrate. There were some interesting correlates that were done in a very small phase one, and that was this drug doesn't seem to work in IDH1 mutated dedifferentiated chondrosarcoma. Those are those blue arrows. And with some genetic analysis, it suggests that in conventional chondrosarcoma, maybe the more genomically complex tumors, those with P53 loss, TERT promoter mutations, and P16 loss may not do as well. It right? gives us some information in potentially how to use this drug, but also thinking about how we can study it when we know that chondrosarcoma is a really difficult disease to study. Variable presentations, right? Some are indolent, some are aggressive, different stages that it can happen in locally advanced, metastatic, and a very difficult disease to image. But what I'm going to throw out there is that patients are being treated with these drugs. So what can we learn from patients out in the community that are being treated? with these drugs. Another example, another one of the success, and again, these are really important that we have these drugs. This is Fiaro, anab serolimus in patients with Pacoma. We know that Pacomas respond to mTOR inhibitors. This is beautiful data, again, showing overall response rates of 40 percent, median progression-free survivals of 10 months. Again, drug is approved off of a small data set. We may know how to use this drug, but I think what was really interesting was in some of the correlates. When you look at that spider plot, it's really preferential responses are in TSC2 mutated tumors, right? And that's, or excuse me, TSC2, yeah, two mutated tumors, and that's critical, right? What we know about TSC2 mutated tumors is they tend to be more penetrant. TSC1 mutations often have a bunch of other mutations there as well that are probably active. So do we think about that when we use this drug? Does that affect patient responses, right? Is this the beginning of a way to study the drug? Because this drug is being used in clinical practice, too. So what can we learn from that? But we also have a drug that's penny to the dollars on this, rapamycin. Do they have the same response patterns? Is rapamycin as good a drug? We don't know. But should we know that as a community, right? These are important questions for our patients. A few more examples, because these were, these were efforts that were brought together by the community in combination with our pharmaceutical colleagues. Angiosarcoma, really some interesting observations of responses to immunotherapy, really nice work by Corey Painter, showing that there's a subset of these, especially the cutaneous head and neck, that have UV exposure signatures, and these are the tumors that preferentially respond. So on our NCCN guidelines, we have pembrolizumab and we have recently ipilimumab and nivolumab qualified under certain circumstances. Do we as a community know what those certain circumstances are? These drugs are being used all of the time in patients with angiosarcoma in the United States. But we don't have a consistent way of approaching this. This was a nice study by Evan Rosenbaum just looking at 35 patients on um, angiosarcoma on immunotherapy. So you could argue cutaneous head and necks have higher progression-free survival, but not always. There's a wide range of outcomes. So just having cutaneous head and neck doesn't guarantee you're going to respond to the drug. Maybe it's high tumor mutation burden or a UV signature. I don't know. Maybe not, right? Maybe it's just not dependent on that either. And there are subsets of patients who have visceral disease, radiation-associated Stuart treves that actually have really nice responses to immunotherapy with angiosarcoma. So how do we as a community begin to figure this out? Patients are being treated with these drugs all of the time in the community. How do we classify angiosarcoma? And when we think about treatments, do we classify it differently than just location? Is it based on omics, the clinical behavior of the disease? How do we study this? We know this can be a disease that also responds to chemotherapy. How do we order our treatments, right? Really important questions that as a community we need to start answering. Alveolar soft part sarcoma will be my last example, right? Very 
simple genetic mutation. But I'll argue that all of these tumors have really different clinical presentations, and I'll say that uh, head and neck primaries with lung patterns like this that spare the upper lung fields and involve the lower lung fields is a different disease than the extremity truncal. How do we treat them? Well, we said we couldn't do a randomized clinical trial in this disease. Ian Judson proved us wrong and showed really nice activity with sidernib. Took some time to accrue, but a really nice study. And then immunotherapies came in. This is activity of a CTLA-4 inhibitor with a PD-1 inhibitor. Dr. Wilkie's study, which I think was the first one that showed activity with a PD-1 inhibitor and a VEGF-based TKI. And Dr. Chen at the NCI has really championed single agent atezolizumab. This drug is now FDA approved for ASPS. But do we understand the patients who are responding? Do we understand the patients who do not respond? How can we actually learn about this? And how do we use these drugs in practice? This was just a nice retrospective analysis saying that it's kind of all over the place. You know, maybe that's good for us clinicians because we can choose to do, but why can't we figure out what is the appropriate way to start treatment for our patients? Is it with a VEGF-based TKI? Is it with a PD-1 inhibitor alone? Is it with a PD-1 inhibitor with a CTLA-4? Is it with a PD-1 inhibitor with a VEGF-based TKI? We don't know. Do we need to sequence these drugs? How do we salvage? when all of a sudden we see resistance? Is it different for the various clinical presentations that I spoke about? So how do we approach ASPS? Does the impetus lie on us as a community to figure it out? Yes, because if we can do that, then we can begin to dictate the appropriate developmental strategies for this diseases. Is our community thinking about that? Yes, and this is important. So here's ERSWIG. I think we're going to coin that from TARPSWIG, but it's the Ultra Rare Sarcoma Working Group, which is international collaborators that get together each year to think about a disease. And we pull all of our data together from academic centers to say, what can we learn about these diseases, and can we think about how to study that? It's an amazing approach, but it's also a challenging one. So when we think about certain countries in Europe, very well organized. Patients with sarcoma go to tertiary care sarcoma centers. They're tremendous in sharing data, and they have wonderful opportunities to do that. So it's relatively easy to get accurate and complete histories on the patients. In the United States, it's a lot more difficult. Patients come to see us at our expert tertiary care centers. They get their diagnosis confirmed. They may get a plan of action, and then they often go back to the community and they're treated closer to home, or they travel all around to multiple different centers to actually get their care based on need, based on opportunity, based on clinical trials. So do we have ways that we can pull together data from all of these medical records? And I'll say yes, because recently in the United States there was the Health Information Exchanges Act, where if a patient signs a consent and says, I want my medical record we have the right to get all of their medical records. And there are now data extraction companies that within half an hour can pull data from thousands and thousands and thousands of medical records, genomic imaging, right? So really an opportunity to understand the natural history of these diseases, really an opportunity to understand how patients are doing with the treatments that we're giving them at our various centers. And so are there ways to do this? I think the answer is yes. There's efforts within the community looking to use real-world data from EHRs to really define the natural history of these diseases. And I, important to understand the clinical and genomic variants, identify repurposed drugs, and think about innovative non-interventional and interventional studies, right? And this is just an example with ERSWIG, the CDRC, X-Cures, patient advocacy groups, mm -hmm. and academic centers, right? So how do we grow this? How does an organization like SARC help with that? How do we put the collective us, meaning our patients, together so we can begin to do this um, in a collaborative way? Here are some of the aims of this effort. One is to establish a mechanism of complete data collection from multiple sources. The effort's going to start with EHE and PICOMA because we need diseases to start with, and these are diseases that we treat with rapamycins. But through these diseases, we want to create a comprehensive algorithm for such data extraction so we can understand the natural history of these diseases and 
use experts like you to actually go through that data, make sure it's complete and accurate for the disease, and then put it in a federated database so that all members of the international community can use it when they want to use it, but we can trust the data. What's the other thing that we can do? Well, once we have the data, we could simulate multiple, multiple different clinical trials, right? So you can look at patients with PCOMA that have TSC2 mutations versus TSC1 mutations. You can look at patients with EHE that have serosal disease versus liver and lung disease. And you can simulate the treatments that they're receiving, because many of these patients are receiving rapamycin in the community. And you can see where the outcomes are. You can change the outcomes and see what may be best for a clinical trial, right? So you can begin to create this data set that's available to the community so that we're able to potentially understand the patients that were treated. And this is a little bit of a loftier ask, but you know, we want to work with regulators. We want to understand that the data we're collecting is appropriate for them, but more importantly, we want to inform the outcomes of these clinical trials, what's right for the patients. We're working with patient advocacy groups because we understand that the needs of the patients are actually represented in this. And then there's a lot of talk and going to be a lot of meetings here this, this ASCO about how do we create decentralized, flexible, adaptive clinical trials for rare diseases so that when you have people who present with the disease, you can open up a study arm and treat them with rapamycin on protocol at low cost but collecting data and making it available to, again, investigators that are interested in this disease. PCOMA and EHE is where we're going to start, right, which I think is important. But look, all of the diseases I discussed before we need working groups. We need people interested in those diseases. We need people who want to pull the data, review the data, make sure the data elements are accurate, the curation's accurate, make sure that when we get the data, it's going to be used correctly, right? So how does our community begin to do this in parallel so we're just not focused on one disease per year? Can we do it? Yes, we can do it. Do we need to do it? Yes. Is this the right time? Yes, because we have the technology and the technology is only growing, right? So a summary of this part of the talk is we need to start with early focused development, single diseases, homogeneous presentations, but we need to understand the historical aspects of the disease, how they respond to our best treatments, how it's different for the different clinical and genomic variants of the disease, how to partner that with the really nice science that we heard today. And when we do that, then we can think about designing the right clinical trials, starting with early signal and extension cohorts in phase one clinical trials, but then you know, really moving that out into larger pivotal efforts where we're not studying different patient populations. We need to understand the drugs we use, the mechanisms of actions, it needs to be rich and correlative. I can look across the room and I know everyone here is doing this in individual diseases and that's exciting. How do we pull it all together, right? That's what becomes important. So the last few minutes, I just want to talk about dedifferentiated liposarcoma why, it'll be evident in a second, but, you know, this is a disease that we know a lot about. Um, really complex copy number alterations, mostly amplifications early on, some deletions later on, but we all know about the 12Q dual amplicon CDK4 and MDM2 that we believe are very important in the pathogenesis and the propagation of the disease. Um, this has been shown in multiple different models. Really excited about MDM2 inhibitors, right? We've been waiting to get these drugs for long, long periods of time. Some Herculean efforts by our community to understand dose and schedule. Really nice data in the phase one extension cohorts of 7.2 months progression free survival, right? So a lot of the single arm studies I showed, that's what got the drugs approved. But then we did what we do, and we go to a pivotal phase three study, and it's negative. Right? So interesting, this is just the press release, 3.6 months for the MDM2 inhibitor, 2.2 months for trabecidin. Why did this happen? We can't just run a study in isolation. You know, we know the, the target, we know the disease, we see great signals early on, and then we run a larger phase three study and it's lost. Well, let's look at this. 3.6 months, milidometrin trabected in, in two large phase three studies, 2.2 months. Selenexor, another randomized phase two, three study, 2.8 months. Ribulin, drugs approved, two months. Decarbazine, two months. Placebo, two months, right? First line doxorubicin, do we know? 
But again, we know these drugs have activity. Just like I knew evophosphamide activity, I knew alaritumab have activity, I know IDH1 mutant tumors respond to ivocitidine. I know that tazemetostat works in epithelioid sarcomas. I know angiosarcomas respond to immunotherapy, right? But why do we see data like this? So there was an interesting study looking at combining CDK4 and MDM2 inhibitors, potentially a way to salvage it. I think when you look at the outcomes four months, right, is that a sign that this is activity of additive effects with drugs, right? I mean, I think we have to question this. There's a lot of data, you know, in CDK4 inhibitors in liposarcoma, and I just want to show some of this because I'm interested in it. Um, two studies looking at palbociclid median progression-free survival, 4.2 months, similar to what we saw in the combinations, right, with, with CDK4 and MDM2. Abemaciclid, maybe a little better, CDK4 inhibitor, median progression-free survival, 30 weeks, but you know, I've just spent the whole talk talking about the caution of single arm phase two studies and outcomes. But I, I do think, you know, we'll answer this question. There's SARC-41 that you'll hear about later. Um, and it's against placebo, so we'll really learn about this disease, which I hope we do. Hopefully it's rich in correlates at well. But I wanted to put together for this presentation a waterfall plot of all the patients treated on those palbociclib studies. What you see here are three groups. There's disease that rapidly progresses through drug, and these patients had progression coming on to study. There's a patient who hit that medium in that red circle, and it's exciting, right, because four to six months is reasonable, but there are patients who remain on drug for years and years and years. Why are these patients different? We wanted to look at this more from the activity of what the CDK4 inhibitors do within the cell cycle. And original convention within cell cycle biology was that when a cell is treated with some sort of toxic stimuli, doxorubis, in a CDK4 inhibitor, they exit the cell cycle, but they can either go into a reversible state known as quiescence or a irreversible state known as senescence. And it was always thought that senescence is the more favorable outcome working with Andy Kauf at Memorial Sloan Kettering, a real-world renowned cell cycle biologist, what was really discovered is that all cells upon exposure of a CDK4 inhibitor leave the cell cycle and they undergo quiescence, right? So this reversible state. But there's a portion of them that undergo a process known as giroconversion and become senescent. And there was a lot of experiments and a lot of cool work done, but you know what's critical for this? It's the downregulation of MDM2. CDK4 inhibitors cause senescence by downregulating MDM2. You have dissociation of a ubiquitin protein, a deubiquitin protein known as HAUSC, and MDM2 is earmarked for ubiquination, and it's downregulated in a P53 independent and RB dependent fashion. It calls into question do we want to combine a CDK4 inhibitor with an MDM2 inhibitor if one of the mechanisms of efficacy is causing senescence? and we're down-regulating the target. Maybe there's better ways to sequence that, but we should think about it. This was done with a lot of really nice cell line work, um, engineered cell lines, but it was even shown in patient samples from palbociclib. In patients who did not respond to drug, they didn't have down-regulation of MDM2. In patients who had long responses, there was down-regulation of MDM2. This is now understood convention within the cell cycle biology world. That gyro conversion for it to happen really requires MDM2 downregulation. Knowing that MDM2 is downregulated allowed us to look for other components to this, right? And there's really two interesting proteins. PDLIM7 can prevent this. CDH18 and E cadherin can actually bind to PDLIM7 and sequesters it to allow this process to happen. So it allows MDM2 downregulation in the cells to progress into senescence. Why is this important? Because these may be biomarkers. You can use proximity ligation assays to show this, but they're difficult clinically, but you can do simple staining for CDH18 on IHC. And if you do that on historical samples, anywhere prior to treatment with the CDK4 inhibitor, it seems to be a little predictive of progression-free survival. We don't know if it's the same with abemaciclib, but abemaciclib is dosed continuously. So some of the effect may be continued quiescence versus senescence. And it also seems to correlate with overall survival, but we don't know if this is predictive or prognostic. So potentially an easy pretreatment biomarker that we can look at in SARC-41. Well, what else happens? There's another interesting 
protein involved in this, and it's ATRX. ATRX is a really complicated protein, but for the purposes of this, it is actually a Swysniff family of chromatin remodeling agents, and it's actually recruited into these foci that you see in the nucleus of cells, and this is predictable, quantifiable, and tractable, and it stabilizes the senescence-associated heterochromatic foci. So this has given us a tool to actually tease out you know, the mechanisms that happen temporarily in these cells, right? So ATRX is also critical to allow for the downregulation of MDM2. The other thing that ATRX does is it suppresses HRAS, right? So if you have aberrant HRAS signaling or you don't have ATRX function, cells don't go into senescence even when there is some component of MDM2 downregulation. But this work has also begun to define the different states of senescence. We always thought of senescence as one state, but it's not. There's pre-senescent cells that actually have a lot of the markers that we used to use in tissue to define senescent cells. There's a pro-senescent cell that has those markers but has also undergone a stable growth arrest. And then there's senescent cells that have the stable growth arrest but also in invoke the inflammatory SASP that is critical to senescence. But this inflammatory SAS is really complicated, and it does good things and bad things within the body. From a cancer standpoint, it can be pro-tumorigenic or anti-tumorigenic. But we're really interested in the immunogenicity of what happens in senescent cells. And are we interested in that in liposarcoma? Well, sure. Why? Because we're seeing responses of liposarcoma to checkpoint inhibitors. This was a nice study run by Sandra D'Angelo and Tony Conley. And what it really was showing was that there are subsets of patients with liposarcoma who respond. Similar patterns. You have some patients who actually can remain on drug for long periods of time, some patients, you know, four to six months, which is nice, and some tumors rapidly progress. This isn't the only study that has shown this, but the question is, you know, can we begin to combine CDK4 inhibitors with checkpoint inhibitors, and is that good or bad? Um, does that work through senescence, and is that senescence good or bad? You know, these are important questions, but there's an ongoing study of Palbo and a PD-1 inhibitor, and importantly with this study is that there's longitudinal biopsies, so biopsies pre, biopsies six weeks after, biopsies six months if patients remain on study, so we can begin to see the longitudinal effects of CK4 inhibitor. Is it causing senescence? Is that senescence good over long periods of time? Um, there's also going to be a study of a palbociclib plus a MEK inhibitor for HRAS suppression in downstream. It's going to be run in parallel and have the same biopsies, right? And what's really important now are there are ways to actually look at truly senescent cells in tumor sample, those cells that should be causing this immune-mediated response, and then you can correlate cells that are becoming senescent and what's the immune-mediated response to it, and then with longitudinal effects, you know, is that good or bad for patients, or is there a time, you know, where we have to think about changing treatments? So, so it's just to suggest that all of us in the community are sitting on a lot of data that can inform the overall clinical trial process from a scientific standpoint. We're sitting on a lot of treatment data that we need to get from medical records, right? And so how do we community, do we begin to do that? Specifically for this, you know, what are the true signals that we're seeing with CDK4 and MDM2 inhibitors? How do we understand appropriate usage? And are these discordant outcomes we're seeing really because the drugs don't work or we're not studying them correctly? And if it's the latter, we got to get together as a community and begin to figure this out, and I think the time is right to do this. So I'm going to end with a quote from James Welch who is a uh, famous American poet and writer. And he said, my poems are just kind of all over the place. They had no focus, no location, nothing, kind of a series of images that could have been set anywhere. A lot of my poems were just exercises for myself. I think about this all the time when I design clinical trials because I just don't want to cross out poems and put clinical trials there and saying, are we doing this with some direction? But here's the challenge for our community. We are at a point where we've had tremendous success how do we coalesce as a community to actually begin to take this to the next level? I had to put a thank you slide up here, so I threw the memorial group up there, but it's really to thank this community for the work that you've done. And what's evident in this community, it's not about the proverbial me. It's about how do we come together at the team and dictate what needs to be done with our patients for them and then influence outward. That's the success we need, and hopefully that'll spur the discussion of where an organization like SARC can help with that.
Thank you.